I don't want to grow up, I'm a curious kid The world has a hundred questions I can play with So I'll open my arms and eyes And wonder every day till the day I die No one really knows why gravity exists well, I'm delighted to be here It's good to be back where there are actually people in the room you know, for the last six months or so, I had to remind myself to have my pants on when I talk to in, in, in public for so many Zoom calls. Uh, but what I'd like to chat with you tonight about is uh, is going to the stars. And uh, this is a a topic that uh, that I found fascinating uh, ever since I was I give away my age uh, was a uh, a little kid in the 1950s. Uh, in fact, when I was in high school, I used to read science fiction books and have them hidden in my textbooks. Uh, the, I wondered why the teacher didn't complain, but the, uh, one of the teachers told my parents that uh, I'd rather have him read the science fiction than bothering the other students in the class. Uh, so, uh, so I don't have any trouble with people reading, uh, reading science fiction. So if you're reading some tonight, that's fine. Uh, but what I'd, like to, what I'd like to do is, is, is talk a little bit about uh, the uh, uh, several topics. Uh, first, talk about private sector uh, space initiatives. Uh, this is an increasingly important area. Uh, I'm an astronomer by background, uh, and if you go look at most of the observatories uh, uh, in the United States, they were built with private money, including Lick. Uh, Lick was the uh, was uh, one of the richest people in California, and uh, uh, he built that observatory nearby. Uh, the, uh, for a lot of different reasons. Uh, if you go up there and, and, and get a special tour, he's actually buried in the pier of, of the, uh, uh, so it, it's kind of an impressive uh, effort. I, I have to tell you, I took our, my current sponsor, Yuri Milner, up there, and, and I didn't know they were going to show him the tomb. And so he looked at me and he said, I'm not dead yet. Uh, so uh, so uh, anyhow, one has to be careful what you show your boss. Uh, but uh, I'd like to talk about, uh, 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 solar sailing, which I think is a is a is a near-term uh, uh, application of uh, of uh, some of the technology we're developing, and I'd like to talk about another a couple of fun things too. That uh, there's now a search undergoing for interstellar material on the Earth, and I'll talk about some of that. Well, let me talk a little bit about the Breakthrough Prize Foundation. Uh, this was founded in in 2010 uh, by a number of high net worth people, including. Mark Zuckerberg, uh, I mentioned Yuri Milner, uh, my principal sponsor, uh, an Israeli investor. Uh, uh, Sergey Brin, the co-founder of Google, and Jack Ma, the founder of Alibaba. Uh, the idea that these folks had was, uh, if you look at list of who the most admired people are on the planet, uh, there's not very many scientists in those lists. You might see Einstein, or you might see Hawking, uh, but uh, uh, these folks are concerned because they've made a lot of money in the last few decades based on science discoveries made a century ago. And so the idea was that uh, uh, can they do something that, uh, that, would, that would increase the excitement about science, uh, especially with young people. Uh, and being billionaires, they figured, well, they give away money. Uh, so they uh, uh, set up in, in 2010 the Breakthrough Prize. Uh, which is the was is intended and is the largest prizes in science. Uh, uh, we give uh, seven three million dollar prizes. It's about three times the size of some uh, Swedish prize. I'm not supposed to mention. Uh, but uh, I was uh, I was the director at NASA Ames in in, in 20, uh, uh, 2010, and uh, my chief of staff came in and and she said, uh, "You'll never guess who is here to see you." And I said, no, I probably won't guess who's here to see me. She says, well, it's uh, Vanity Fair magazine. I said, Vanity Fair? I said, well, I said, I said I I am I the best dressed center director? And I said, no, you're kind of near the bottom, she said. And so, uh, but it, it turns out that, that, that Vanity Fair uh, hosts the post-Oscar party. It's the biggest party in Hollywood, which I've never been invited to, although I keep hinting. Uh, but the billionaires get to go to that, and uh, they felt that it was important to not only give this prize out, but have something that would engage with the public. Uh, so they asked Vanity Fair to help set up uh, basically the Oscars uh, of science, and they decided to have the, the ceremony on the campus of NASA Ames, 
Uh, it has been held there for about eight years. Uh, the last two years we've deferred it because of COVID. Although this year I think it's going to be held in Los Angeles. Uh, but uh, uh, they wanted to know if they could use, the, if, if you drive by 101, you see these big airship hangars. They wanted to know if they could use those airship hangars, and, and uh, I said yes, and uh, almost got fired for it. Uh, but the, uh, uh, the, uh, we ended up having this ceremony, uh, and one of the things they always tell you if you're, a, if you're having a big party is invite the landlord. Uh, so I was the landlord and got invited. Uh, and I got a chance to, to, to meet a number of the, uh, of the high net worth people. Uh, but uh, this is really a, a pretty cool ceremony. Uh, it's, uh, it's broadcast live on, on Nat Geo and, and Discovery Channel and a few others. Uh, this year we're going to hold it in, uh, in June. Uh, but uh, people say it's, the, it, it's the, the only black tie affair in Silicon Valley. Uh, we, we had to persuade people like Sergey Brin that black tie didn't mean black t-shirt, uh, but at least he wore a black jacket the last time. Uh, but uh, well, it's a pretty cool event and it's, it's our intent to make uh, uh, Zionist uh, heroes and I think it's been pretty successful. Now I want to point out, because we probably have a number of, of young people, particularly high school students here, uh, that uh, for the last few years we've given out what's called the Breakthrough Junior Challenge. And uh, this is a pretty cool uh, prize. It's, uh, uh, we ask uh, for young people between the ages of 13 and 18 uh, to, uh, to make a, a couple minute video about some fundamental scientific principle in physics, mathematics, or life sciences. Uh, we get something like 10,000 uh, 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 applications each year. Uh, I chair the selection committee, so I think it's one of the coolest things. The winner gets a... Uh, a 250,000 U.S. dollar scholarship to go wherever they want to go for college. Uh, the, uh, the school gets a $150,000 laboratory, uh, which is kind of a pretty cool thing. But to me, the neatest thing is we give the teacher that inspired the student uh, a $50,000 check. Uh, and uh, I remember the first year, the young man in, the, in, the, in, the, in, in your upper left up there was from Cleveland, Ohio, and uh, he didn't tell the teacher that, that he nominated him. So when we called up uh, uh, the uh, teacher and said, where do we send your $50,000 check? He said, is this a call from Nigeria? And uh, well, we finally got, uh, get, got it to him. And uh, uh, we've had, uh, there's, there's been eight winners if, uh, around the world. Uh, I'm really pleased that, uh, that, uh, that over half of them have been women. Uh, the, uh, uh, the young lady in the lower right is from Mauritius. Uh, that won this last year. Uh, we've had winners from, from the Philippines, from Peru, uh, from Singapore, uh, India, uh, and the U.S. Uh, so it's a really cool, cool effort. I, on our website, uh, you'll see the announcement uh, for this, so I encourage young people to, to, uh, uh, to look at that. Uh, now, what I want to talk about mostly is, uh, is uh, the Breakthrough Initiatives. Uh, this is funded uh, primarily by Yuri Milner, although there's a number of other high net worth people investing in, in this. And this is the question, is uh, life in the universe? Uh, and there's, uh, there's sort of three main questions. The first one is, is there intelligent life elsewhere in the universe? Now, every time I get asked about this, somebody says, well, is there intelligent life on Earth? <laughs> and uh, that's an interesting question. Uh, my answer to that is that that uh, the more likely you are to find it is the farther away you are from a national capital. Uh, but uh, th this program is currently led by UC Berkeley up the road. Uh, we are, uh, the, this next year we're going to have it co-led by uh, the University of Oxford in the UK and the University of Berkeley, or California at Berkeley. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about, uh, about this effort, but it's to look for intelligent signals, what are called techno-signatures. Uh, I'll tell you that we, we thought we found one a few years ago, uh, so I'll show you some of that data. Uh, but, but then the question, is there any life elsewhere in the universe? And just to remind people, uh, we don't know of any life elsewhere. Uh, you know, we, we think there could be life uh, places in our solar system. I'll talk about my favorite place to look, and we actually have a mission to go look there. That's the, the, the planet Venus. Uh, but the third effort is the one I want to talk mostly about tonight, is can we travel between the stars? 
and, and what's the possibility of doing that and some of the efforts that, that, that we've done. Well, first, let me talk about the, the SETI effort, the Breakthrough Listen effort. Uh, this is a $100 million 10-year uh, effort. And it's, uh, uh, as I said, it's led by Berkeley and will soon be co-led by the University of Oxford. Uh, we have uh, time uh, on uh, most of the world's large radio telescopes, as well as many of the, of the, of the large optical telescopes that, uh, uh, that uh, we've been looking for an intelligent signal. And uh, uh, this, uh, these efforts first started in the early 1960s. Uh, there's been a couple tentative detections, but uh, none of them have proven to be uh, repeatable or, or confirmed. Uh, we're also starting to use spacecraft. That's the TESS mission in the center there that uh, is looking for planets orbiting nearby stars. We've been using uh, that as well. A couple of instruments I want to point out. Uh, uh, the, uh, this one is the, the world's biggest radio telescope today. It's the 500 meter uh, radio telescope in China. Uh, we've been doing a lot of work with, uh, with, with that instrument. Uh, uh, the other instrument I want to point out is on the, uh, on the upper right over here is, uh, is what's called Meerkat. It's a uh, telescope in, in South Africa. Uh, there's currently 64 uh, 18 meter radio dishes. Eventually there'll be 2,000 of these radio dishes across Southern Africa. It will have the equivalent uh, uh, collecting area of, a, of a, kilom a square kilometer, so it would be four times bigger than the, than the, uh, than the, than the Chinese instrument. We also have a number of other optical and, and, uh, and radio instruments we've been using. Now, I want to talk particularly about this one. Uh, this is the Parkes radio telescope in New South Wales in Australia. Uh, we've been working about eight years on this instrument. Uh, it's, a, it's a rather old instrument. It was built in the early 1960s. Uh, it's uh, 64 meters in diameter. Uh, it's kind of a cool instrument, and uh, it's, very, it's actually quite famous. The uh, moonwalk, uh, uh, the, the first moonwalk from Apollo 11, was received at this, by this radio telescope. There's a really lovely uh, Australian movie called The Dish. That, uh, that, you know, it's a family-friendly movie, so you can, you can show anybody you want. Uh, but I really love it, and uh, it, it, it's quintessentially Australian. Uh, it, it, it opens up with them playing cricket in the, in the, in the, in the radio antenna in the bottom of it. Uh, it and it's, uh, it's, a, it's a really neat uh, effort. But about two years ago, uh, actually it turned out on Halloween, uh, and I live most of the time in Europe, and I was in Luxembourg, and and I got a call from the principal investigator, uh, Dr. Andrew Simeon from Berkeley, and he, he, he couldn't contain himself. He said, I think we have a signal. And uh, so I went and got a bottle of champagne. And uh, he told me about the signal that, ma that had all the features that we would look for. Uh, and before I had my second bottle of champagne, he called back and he said, but I want to caution you that, that, uh, that uh, first of all, we need to validate this. And, uh, uh, the, uh, you know, it's probably going to be interference. And uh, so I, I put the second bottle away and waited. Uh, and, and I said, now look, don't tell anybody until we know what's going on here. And he said, okay, he swore there was like 12 people on the team, swore them all to secrecy. And two, da two days later, uh, you know, the, 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 so nobody can keep anything secret. Uh, I, I think if uh, you know, people say, well, maybe the U.S. government has some secret stuff, uh, I don't think they could keep it secret. Uh, we certainly couldn't. Uh, but uh, the, uh, it took us about two or three months to, to review this, and, I, and I'll show the data here. This is, a, uh, this is uh, the, the data. This is what's called a waterfall diagram. Uh, on this axis is time. And this is frequency, and these are in uh, uh, where the center frequency is 982 megahertz. Uh, this red line is a, is a calibration signal. And what you see, these little bands here, uh, the, in order to look for a signal to see if it's real, we take the telescope and we rock it on and off the source. Now, what was fascinating about this source is this is the very nearest star. This is Proxima Centauri. 
And we now know that Proxima Centauri has several planets, uh, uh, two of which seem to be Earth size in the habitable zone, meaning they could have liquid water. The signal itself is this red or this yellow streak, which you can see here. Uh, it lasted for a few hours, and when we moved the telescope off, it went away. Uh, that suggesting that this was, was a real signal. It was a very narrow band. Uh, the, uh, it was only about a hertz in, in, in bandwidth. Uh, uh, natural signals always are much broader, you know, hundreds or hundreds of kilohertz. Uh, so we, uh, we looked at this and got quite excited, uh, except that uh, uh, we looked at a lot of other data around this period. And, and by the way, there's, there was some evidence of the day before and the day after for, for signals on this. And, uh, I might add that it took a year and a half after we took the data for somebody to finally look at it. Uh, it turned out it was a student at, at, a, at, a, at Hillsdale College in Michigan that finally found it. And, uh, uh, the, but we now found other signals that looked a little similar in that same period. So we're almost certain that this is interference caused by, by human interference. Uh, but at any rate, we got a number of papers in Nature Astronomy, which is the you know, it's kind of like being in Rolling Stone if you're a rock star. Uh, so it was, it was a, a pretty cool result. But one of the things that we really learned from this is that uh, uh, it, it's really hard to listen, particularly for radio signals uh, on the Earth, because we're in a blizzard of, of, of radio signals, cell phones, everything uh, radiates. Uh, the, uh, it turns out there's a solution, at least for a while, and uh, we've just begun to do some studies that can we put an ob a radio observatory on the far side of the moon uh, that uh, where the, the, the bulk of the moon would block most of the radio interference, although we are worried that people are starting to put satellites and other things in, in lunar orbit. Uh, but, uh, but this is something that you, you might hear more about in the next decade uh, with more and more capabilities of going to the moon affordably. Uh, this is, this is a, a really quite an exciting effort. Well, let me, uh, let me talk a little bit about the nearest star, because uh, this is, this is our, our target for a lot of things. Uh, this is the Alpha Centauri system. Uh, there's actually three stars in the system. Uh, one of them is a little bit bigger than the sun, and one of them is a little bit smaller. They're probably uh, a little older than the sun. Uh, the two solar-type stars orbit around each other with about an 80-year period. And the, uh, 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 it turns out if you were orbiting Alpha Centauri A, uh, the, the one that's probably most like the sun, uh, you know, where the Earth is, Alpha Centauri B would be about where the uh, planet to, between Uranus and Neptune. And uh, uh, it would be very bright. You wouldn't get much heat from it, but uh, it would certainly be much, much brighter than the full moon. The third star is, is uh, I already mentioned, is Proxima Centauri. It's what's called a red dwarf star, and it's uh, only about 10% the mass of our sun. Uh, it's only about a ten thousandth of the, of the energy output. Uh, but red dwarf stars are interesting because 70% of the stars in the galaxy are red dwarf stars. Uh, it orbits the other two stars very distant. It's uh, 10,000 times further away uh, from those stars than the Earth is from the sun. So it would be just barely visible uh, if, you were, if you were orbiting Alpha Centauri A. Uh, well, when we started our program to see if we could f figure out if there was anything there, nobody knew about any planets in this system. Uh, but about uh, a year after we, we talked, started talking about maybe going there and, and doing studies on it, uh, the uh, European Southern Observatory announced uh, in Munich that a planet had been discovered indirectly orbiting Proxima Centauri, the red dwarf star, that was the size of the Earth in the habitable zone. Uh, since then, there's, a, there's, a, there's another planet even closer that's probably a little smaller, maybe Mars size, uh, that's also in the habitable zone. And there's a, a bigger planet a little further out. Uh, the, uh, the, the European Southern Observatory was, uh, was uh, nice enough to, uh, uh, to invite, us to the, uh, invite me to the, to the uh, press conference. Uh, so we were nice enough to give them five million dollars uh, to, to do a uh, do a program to actually see if we could directly image planets. Uh, 
the uh, I had a little bit of trouble persuading my sponsor because I showed him this picture. This is what they released at the press conference, and he said, well, "Why do we need to go there if we know what it looks like already?" Uh, be careful what you tell billionaires. Uh, but uh, uh, it, you know, it was a, a a pretty cool effort. Now I have to say that the uh, uh, that uh, uh, this was a kind of a, you know, I've got these a little out of order, but let me uh, shift to this one. Uh, this is the, uh, the European Southern Observatory's uh, very large telescope. There's uh, four eight and a half meter telescopes there. Now, whenever I show this, I'm sort of embarrassed about astronomers naming things. Uh, it's a very large telescope. Now, I kid you not, they're building a bigger one, a 39 meter, which they've called the extremely large telescope. Uh, now, I happen to know the history of this. Originally, it was supposed to be almost twice that size, and it was going to be called the overwhelmingly large telescope. Uh, but uh, uh, it, it was, it was a, it, 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 a pretty neat effort, and uh, uh, the, uh, uh, I need to show this picture. Uh, we found a planet tentatively, orbiting Alpha Centauri A. Uh, now, you probably recognize this is from the Avatar movie in 2009. And how many of you have seen the recent one? I thought the 2009 one was better. But that's. Uh, uh, but at any rate, the, uh, what's interesting is the planet we found orbiting Alpha Centauri A is a giant planet. And uh, uh, in uh, Avatar, there's a giant planet. I think it's called Polyphemus. And it has moons that uh, one of which is not only habitable, but inhabited. Uh, so we were kind of excited, but Yuri Milner uh, knew James Cameron. And so we had a, a uh, uh, this is a year and a half ago, we had our annual conference this time online. And uh, uh, Cameron was busy filming Avatar 2, 3, and 4 in New Zealand. But he, uh, he spent about an hour uh, at, in our conference talking about Avatar. He was quite excited. Uh, but the, uh, the, the interesting thing that he, uh, he mentioned is that uh, how did he plan on getting starships to Alpha Centauri? And uh, he said, well, they were going to use uh, uh, a really powerful laser to push it and then a fusion engine to stop it at the other end, uh, which is sort of ideas I think make a lot of sense. And I'm going to talk more about, about some of those. Uh, we are trying to confirm that there's a... Uh, a, uh, uh, a, a, a planet uh, there, and this is a mission that's being built for us by the University of Sydney. It'll be launched in about two years. Uh, it's a small spacecraft, and, and what it does is it measures the position extremely accurately of, of Alpha Centauri A relative to Alpha Centauri B, these two stars. And if there's a planet orbiting one of them, the, the star will wobble slightly in its orbit. It's called an astrometric signal. Uh, so this will get launched. Uh, uh, this is a, a truly international uh, effort. Uh, the, the, uh, the, the telescope is built in the US. The, uh, the Australians are integrating the, the effort, and the, uh, and the spacecraft is being built in Bulgaria. So it's, uh, it, it kind of shows that where, where science is going. Uh, but anyhow, what, what I'd like to do is turn to not only maybe we can find things there, but can we go there? And uh, uh, this is the uh, uh, this is the breakthrough Starshot effort that was that was announced uh, on April uh, 12th, uh, 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 2016. Uh, it was announced at the New World Trade Center in New York, and you can see the picture of the announcement there. Uh, that's Yuri Milner on the stage. Uh, you can see Professor Hawking next to him. He was our science advisor until he passed away a few years ago. Uh, Freeman Dyson, uh, another very famous physicist that, uh, that also just passed away recently, uh, uh, was there. Uh, uh, the uh, Andrewian, who's the creator of Cosmos, uh, widow of Carl Sagan. Uh, professor Avi Loeb, who's a Harvard professor who's actually gotten quite famous talking about aliens. And uh, uh, Mae Jemison, who's a former astronaut who's very active in, in looking uh, at interstellar efforts. In fact, I'll, I'll see her in a few weeks. Uh, she's having a conference in Nairobi. Uh, so it's, it, it's quite exciting. And then there's the Kiki guy there, so I won't talk about him. Uh, but 
we started looking at, uh, you know, how, can, how hard is it to go to Alpha Centauri? And uh, uh, we can get there with a the current spacecraft, but it takes about 50 to 100,000 years. Uh, so we doubt that we could find funders, even billionaires, uh, trying to do that. But if we could go 1,000 times faster, we think we could get there in maybe 20 years. Uh, and 1,000 times faster is 20% uh, the speed of light, about 60,000 kilometers a second. Uh, and, uh, you know, that, the, when we first looked at that, uh, the answer was, you know, this is not very easy. Uh, but... Uh, uh, it turns out in the middle of the 20th century, we went a thousand times faster. And uh, uh, so the question is how to do it. Now, uh, you know, the, the, potentially you could do, do it with fusion, uh, but uh, even that's going to be very, very hard. So we kind of went back to an old idea, uh, really old. This is uh, Kepler wrote a letter to. Uh, Galileo in 1610 that said, why don't you sail on heavenly winds? And uh, uh, so this is kind of what we followed up on. Now, uh, in space, there's, there's not wind as we know it, uh, but there is photon pressure. And uh, uh, so the, the way we figured out to do this is uh, we would make a really small satellite, one that weighed a few grams, actually, and you can see we call a star chip in the center. Uh, the, uh, for the wind, we would use uh, uh, laser light, uh, and uh, uh, we'd attach a light sail of maybe 5 or 10 meters in diameter to the chip, uh, and then push it. Uh, this keeps the fuel on the Earth, uh, and it, uh, I'll talk a little bit more about how that might work. Uh, but this, uh, y using light to push things is beginning to be quite exciting, I'm going to talk about how to explore stuff in our own solar system with that. Uh, there's been probably four or five solar sails that have, that have been used. The trouble is the sun isn't powerful enough to get you to 20% the speed of light. It might get you to a few tenths the speed of light, uh, tenths of percent the speed of light. Uh, but uh, uh, that's why we need a laser, a much more powerful effort. Now, as far as the spacecraft, uh, this turned out to be a little uh, less of a challenge than we think. If you have an electronic watch, uh, the chip in that watch is, does everything a spacecraft does. Uh, so we, uh, we think we can make uh, star chips, spacecraft that are a gram. In fact, we launched uh, one a few years ago. Uh, this is uh, Professor Zach Manchester uh, at Carnegie Mellon, formerly at Stanford. Uh, what he's holding there is a, what he calls a Sprite. This is a 10 gram spacecraft. Uh, the, uh, that was built by students, by the way, at uh, a number of universities, and I think that the total cost of each one is about ten dollars. Uh, the uh, we launched a few hundred of them a few years ago. Uh, the U.S. government wasn't happy about it because they thought it was space debris. Uh, but uh, this technology is coming along quite well. Now, as I said, you're going to use a laser to push this thing, and uh, uh, how big a laser do you need? And it turns out it is a humongous laser about 100 gigawatts of power. Uh, and this is an artist's conception of what, of what the laser might look like. Now, Alpha Centauri is in the southern hemisphere. It's about 61 degrees south declination. Uh, so uh, we'd have to put our laser in the southern hemisphere. Uh, and it turns out one of the best places in the world is in the Atacama Desert in, in Chile at, uh, you know, say, 16 to 18,000 feet altitude. Uh, you're above most of the atmosphere. Uh, there's areas there it hasn't rained in a century. Uh, there's, uh, you know, it's a pretty isolated location. Uh, and so when we made our announcement in, in 2016, I, as I showed in that picture, uh, somebody, some of the press asked me, well, where are you going to put this laser? And I said, Chile. Uh, well, one of the things I forgot to ask the Chilean government, <laughs> and uh, I've since been summoned and talked to two presidents of Chile, who, both of them are very nice. They said, look, uh, you know, we like this idea, but please ask us in the future. Uh, the, uh, so th you learn a little bit about, uh, uh, about how, to, how to deal with foreign governments uh, the, nicely. Uh, now, this is a picture of the laser firing. <laughs> uh, you can see nothing. 
uh, because the, the wavelength is, is, uh, is about one micron, so it's not in the visible. Uh, however, this is a picture that we showed our sponsor. Uh, that's, we first showed him what the artist's conception looked like of the laser firing, and he said, this is rubbish, that's why we had the previous one. He said, you wouldn't see the image of the, of the laser with your eye. And so I quickly, quick in my feet, said, well, it's going to heat up dust in the atmosphere. You might see that. I said, all right. So we have another briefing, briefing with him later this week, so I'm going to show him this picture. And, uh, uh, but uh, what, this, uh, what this does is we have a, a series that we call uh, Nanocraft uh, that uh, would be at about uh, 60,000 kilometers orbit. Uh, there's probably hundreds of them on a mothership that would drop them off. Uh, it moves away, and then the laser hits it for about uh, an hour, hits the light sail, which would be a spherical sail like you see in this picture, uh, accelerates it at tens of thousands of Gs, uh, and then gets it going 20% tw the speed of light, uh, you know, and it coast towards uh, Alpha Centauri, or Proxima Centauri. Uh, the, it can do a little bit of maneuvering. It's got small lasers on board that can push it slightly. Uh, but uh, you know, 20, 25 years later, it would fly by a, uh, uh, any planets in the system. Uh, it doesn't stop. It takes images and then uses a small laser to send it back to the Earth. Now, this is a picture from National Geographic. Uh, it's accurate in some senses and not in others. It's accurate that we're going to send hundreds, if not thousands, of these, so we're going to lose a lot. Uh, but they're not all going to arrive at the same time. They arrive a few days apart. Uh, but what's really accurate about this is that you can see holes in the sail. Uh, it turns out there's dust in interstellar space. And going 20% the speed of light, a little tiny piece of dust will make a big hole. And uh, uh, we would probably lose a lot, number of these. Uh, our current architecture is that we wouldn't have a, the chip being a little small chip in a sail. We'd spread the electronics throughout the entire sail. Uh, and so that effort is actually going pretty well. Now, uh, the question is, uh, can we ever send more than gram class and can we stop there? And I mentioned, uh, uh, and this is not a very good uh, diagram, but this is a, uh, there's a company that I've been working with and there's about five or six looking at fusion. Uh, the efficiency of a rocket engine is, is uh, measured by a, a parameter called specific impulse. And if you use a, uh, uh, you can kind of think about it as that if I have a, uh, a rocket that has a specific impulse of 300, I get like 300 pounds of, of thrust for each pound of fuel. That's not exactly correct. That's a way to look at it. Uh, that's not enough to get us to 20% the speed of light. Uh, if I used electric propulsion, where I use electricity to accelerate it, I can get maybe a few thousand specific impulse. Uh, if I use uh, uh, nuclear fission, I got an atomic bomb, I might be able to get 50,000. And then if I use fusion, I might be able to get a half million. And that begins to get us close enough where you could get to, you know, percentages of, of light speed. Uh, and it, there are a number of efforts. So this is this is one that uh, uh, is a is a company called Helicity Space. Uh, there's a, about four or five others, but uh, I think that uh, in the next decade, it's likely that we're going to see fusion propulsion. Uh, the uh, uh, the the question is, can you can you get a, a big spacecraft and then stop at the other end? I actually think that, uh, that uh, James Cameron's idea that you use a laser to push it initially and then use the fusion to stop it at the other end uh, is a way that we may eventually get to, uh, to very large payloads. Uh, uh, with our laser-driven system, our, our systems architect said that probably next century you could build powerful enough lasers that we could send big spacecraft. Uh, maybe not 20% the speed of light, but 5%. Uh, and then you could stop it at the other end with, with fusion. So uh, I'm beginning to be optimistic that not in my lifetime and probably not in yours, but that, that this uh, may actually go someplace. Now, there's another question is uh, what about, you know, warp drives and other things? Uh, we're not funding those. 
but these guys are. Uh, this is the Limitless Space Institute. It's a sister foundation, also privately funded. Uh, it's done a number of, uh, of, of studies on, on ideas that, that, uh, that might get us around sort of some of these limits. Now, one of the ones I kind of like, which not necessarily going to get you at faster than light speed, but, uh, and I won't go into a lot of detail, and this is called the Casimir effect. If you take two plates in a laboratory and bring them very close, there's a, there's a, uh, a force that pulls them together. Uh, the best explanation of the reason that that is done is that if you consider that space itself is a quantum field and that it, it's fluctuating back and forth, they're called quantum background fluctuations, those can be used to push things. So the Limitless Space guys have been funding some folks to look at this. Can we, can we build an engine out of it? Uh, I don't know if there's enough energy in it or if it really works, but it does look to be promising. They're also looking at some more exotic stuff like you know, actual warp drives, uh, which I'm skeptical of, but uh, if you don't put any money into it, you don't know. Well, let me turn a little bit now to something that is likely to work, and these are light sails. Uh, the, uh, uh, for the last uh, couple of years, we've been working with folks who have been working with NASA. Uh, NASA had a solar cruiser mission, which was canceled about six months ago, although we're trying to get it re reinstated. But the idea was to use a light sail to get us to areas so we could observe the sun that are awfully hard to see from, from a, a normal spacecraft. Uh, but there's another concept called uh, a sun diver. And uh, we could build a small light sail craft that uh, maybe weighs a few tens of kilograms and has a set of articulable sails, just like a sailboat. And uh, you, you, you take it to cislunar space, the space between the Earth and the Moon, deploy it, f f unfurl your sails, catch the sunlight, and then use the sunlight to slow down and fall towards the sun. Uh, the closer you get to the sun, the, the more intense the sun is. If we could get to, to maybe a, you know, a tenth uh, of an astronomical unit, so it's like 10 million kilometers from, from the sun, we could get to speeds that are uh, uh, we could get to the outer solar system in a year, uh, to, uh, to Saturn and beyond. So this is a very promising effort, and uh, uh, we're looking, working with a couple uh, private foundations to begin to look at this in detail. Now, one of the, one of the ideas from this is that, uh, that uh, uh, if you can get fast enough, and you have to get pretty close to the sun, say it should go 50 astronomical units a year, so you get to beyond Pluto in a, in a year, uh, we could get out to a point uh, which is called the gravitational lens point. The, the sun itself is, is a big mass, and sunlight is bent when it goes near a mass. Uh, Einstein's uh, equations show that. That it turns out if you can get to about 500 times the distance between the Earth and the sun, that the sun itself will focus light so if we line the sun up with another star system, we could actually make an image of the planets there. And so this looks like a very promising effort. Probably can do it by the middle of the century. Uh, so this is another way to find out if there's life-bearing planets around nearby stars. And, and again, a light sail is very simple. It's just, uh, it works like a, a, you know, a wind sail that, that you get reflected sunlight off the sail and you get a net force. Uh, I think within the next decade or two, we're gonna see you know, an increase in, in sailing in our solar system uh, because it looks to be a lot cheaper and uh, you don't need to carry fuel with you. Uh, this is again a diagram of a sun diver uh, that, uh, that we think we can probably do within a few years. Uh, th this is a, uh, a prototype that's been built by a, a company called Lagarde under NASA uh, efforts. There's a couple other companies now. There's one in Paris uh, and, uh, and a, a couple more throughout the world that are looking at, at sun divers. Well, let me, uh, let, let me kind of, uh, you know, address some other questions about life in our own solar system. Uh, one of the big, uh, you know, just to remind everybody, we don't know of any place in our solar system that, uh, that has life other than Earth. Uh, but there are these five objects that, that are often discussed. Uh, Mars, of course, is, is in fact, I'm you know, confident we're going to find life underneath the surface of Mars. 
and uh, uh, but uh, we're probably going to have to dig through the crust. Uh, and of course, there's a lot of space agency efforts on that. Uh, the uh, uh, some of the moons of the outer planets, uh, particularly uh, uh, Europa orbiting uh, Jupiter and Enceladus and Titan orbiting Saturn, seem to have conditions that could have life. They are called ocean worlds, meaning they've got an ocean underneath a frozen crust. Uh, at least for Enceladus, one of the inner moons of Saturn, and in Europa, which you see in the middle there, uh, it seems that this ice crust cracks and there are plumes of water ejected into space. So we've been looking at can we fund privately funded efforts to go fly through those and see if there's life. Uh, Enceladus, you can see the plumes from the Cassini mission. Uh, it turns out that, uh, that, that Cassini detected primitive organic molecules in the, in the water. Uh, so that's a very exciting area. But my favorite is Earth's evil twin, uh, Venus. And uh, you know, when I was a kid, uh, you used to read science fiction books. There were big oceans on Venus, and, and there were you know, beings sailing around. Uh, although we found out when we actually got there that the surface temperature is about 500 degrees centigrade, so uh, not much sailing. Uh, but uh, it was, there's not much study that's been done there. But about two years ago, there was a tentative detection of a gas called phosphine in the upper atmosphere of Venus. Now, this is highly controversial. Uh, I think it's probably real. There's some evidence that says it is or isn't. Uh, but uh, uh, the level that it was in the atmosphere is about 50 kilometers above the surface. The, the surface of Venus is, is, has about 100 times the density of the atmosphere here, so it's 100 bars. But at uh, 50 kilometers, the, the pressure is about one bar, so it's about the same as it is in this room, and the temperature is about the same as it is in this room. Uh, you're right in the middle of, uh, of the clouds. Now, a, a subtlety is the clouds are made of sulfuric acid, pretty pure. Uh, but uh, we did a number of lab experiments, and we showed that uh, if you, uh, that life could use ammonia to neutralize the sulfuric acid, and there is ammonia in those atmospheres. So uh, th this is a potentially very interesting location. Uh, NASA is now seriously looking at the first human missions outside the Earth-Moon system would be a flyby of Venus. Uh, in fact, they did a study this last summer at, at uh, the, the Keck Institute at Caltech that uh, it, it's called uh, Meeting the Goddess. And uh, it's, it's about half the time of getting to, uh, of getting to, uh, getting to Mars. Uh, so I think it's a very exciting planet. Uh, but there is a private mission uh, that's going to go in about two years. Uh, this is by Rocket Lab uh, in a new... We'll be closing in just 10 minutes. Please prepare to exit the building. Hopefully we're not chased out. Then. But uh, the uh, uh, Rocket Lab is a, is a very successful small rocket company. And uh, uh, the, the head of Rocket Lab, Peter Beck, is, is as interested in Venus as, as Elon Musk is in Mars. Uh, so he's funded a private mission uh, that, that, that has a small probe that, uh, that uh, we and some other uh, private foundations have put an instrument on. And this is run by... Professor Sarah Seeger at, uh, at uh, MIT. And so uh, this will be our first effort to kind of fall through those layers in the atmosphere and look specifically for some of these gases that could indicate life. So it's a very exciting effort. And again, an example of what the private sector can do. Well, let me talk a little bit about, uh, uh, you know, I mentioned Professor Loeb. And uh, he wrote this book called Extraterrestrial uh, about two years ago. It's a bestseller. Uh, uh, he chairs our Starshot Advisory Committee, and he, uh, he pointed out that the first interstellar asteroid called Oumuamua uh, looked more like a light sail than it did an asteroid. Uh, now, he got a little carried away, in my opinion, but uh, he, he at least uh, made a, a plausible case that there could be alien probes in our solar system. Now, about uh, uh, two years ago, uh, he found some data that showed that a uh, interstellar, a small interstellar meteorite hit uh, uh, in, the, in the Pacific Ocean uh, near Papua New Guinea. And uh, 
Uh, it turns out one of my former students is the senior space guy at the White House now. And so we managed to get data from the U.S. military sensors that showed that we can figure out where this thing is to about, uh, to about 10 kilometers. Uh, so there's a private mission to go down that, uh, uh, to this location, and we've probably got it better located now to a few kilometers, uh, that's uh, that funded to, to take a, a magnet and run along the, the, the floor of the, of the ocean. Uh, we're almost 100% certain that this is a metal uh, asteroid. Uh, Avi Loeb thinks it might be alien metal, so it is alien because it came from some other solar system, but whether it's uh, intelligently uh, put together, we don't know. Uh, but anyhow, this is an ex exciting effort, so maybe we'll have real interstellar material here in, a, in, a, in the next few years. Uh, well, I'll stop there, and uh, you know, hopefully uh, in the next few decades, uh, we'll see real missions uh, that are going interstellar one way or the other, and uh, maybe answer the question, are we alone? Thank you, and I'm happy to answer any questions. If you Well, it, it's the, the point is that this is a very tenuous, I mean, it's a thin material. So what, it turns out when you get hit by something, it, it basically makes a small hole. And uh, uh, even, at that even at that speed, wow. you know, because the material is, is blown out. So it's, uh, you know, we've had a, we had a number of analysis on that. That looks to be uh, that, that y y you're not going to have the thing destroyed. Well, a lot of it depends on the material you, you make it to. So even what, what shock waves are in it are going to be damped out pretty fast. That, that, thank you. That's yeah. Can you give the figures again for how long the laser is on the left tail and how quickly it gets out? Yeah. It's, it's 100 gigawatts of power or more. So it's a kilometer scale, maybe a couple kilometers. Uh, we would have the mothership be in a highly elliptical orbit with its, uh, its apogee about 60,000 kilometers, and it's, uh, it, it, would be, it would be, the apogee would be aimed at the Alpha Centauri system. So the, this would be a few days orbit for the mothership. So every couple days it would release a, a, a sail craft that would unfurl. The spacecraft moves away. We then hit it with the, with the laser, uh, focused on it, and uh, for about an hour, uh, it accelerates about 10,000 to 20,000 Gs. Yeah. I mean, materials can do that. I, I mean, you, you aren't going to put anything living on it. Uh, but, uh, I mean, we have artillery shells that, that, that uh, are guided that, uh, that accelerate at almost 100,000 Gs. So it's, uh, uh, the electronics can take a lot. Yeah, the, the, the question was uh, you know, a little bit of the, you know, how long is the laser on and, and, and what does it do? All right, please, yep. So uh, for, the, for the light propulsion, say, why do you need laser light? So the three days and lasers before some sort of, you know, this You need to focus it on the sail. So we need the, the kilometer scale in order to focus it because this accelerates pretty fast. You know, with, with, within an hour, we're, you know, millions of kilometers out and you can no longer focus it so you, on the sail. So you, but it's the coherence and the focusing and the, and the intensity. I mean, because you don't get that intensity even with focus sunlight. So, so I, I, I think I missed, I, maybe I'll talk to you later, I missed why it needs to be coherent, why the photons need to be what, the, the question is, why, why does why the light have to be coherent? Yeah. Because if it's not coherent, you can't focus it. The, the question is, uh, the, the laser uh, is probably one of the biggest challenges, of because we have to make a several kilometer scale thing that we'd like to have it cost, you know, of order 10 billion, what a, like a, the James Webb Space Telescope. Uh, 
if we use today's laser technology, this would cost a trillion dollars because okay, these are big, you know, you know, fiber laser things. Uh, but there are some major breakthroughs. There's that these are sort of there are uh, uh, sort of uh, electronic elements that actually can laze that we could use as like a phased array radio, but we could do it in the optical. Uh, one of them is called VEX cells. I forgot what the, 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 the term stands for. But these are maturing very rapidly so that, that to make this thing cheap enough, it would look like a solar panel. And so it's just electronically steered. And that's, you also have to correct for the Earth's atmosphere. So we need a beacon on the, on the spacecraft that, that you're able to focus on. Uh, so, it, it, I mean, there's a number of, of challenges, but we think we can, uh, uh, we, we have to convince our sponsor to let us do, go to the next, the next phase of this in the next few weeks. So we, we have to convince him that we can make these things affordable. and make it so efficient at the same time? The, the question was, how do you make a fusion engine powerful and efficient at the same time? That's a good question. <laughs> uh, uh, th that's what we don't know how to do yet. But there are ideas that uh, th this particular one I showed is that uh, you know, the, the problem with fusion, you have to have very high temperatures. And uh, uh, to ignite the, the, the hydrogen. And that's very hard to do. I mean, today on the Earth, there's a bunch of efforts that there's one over here at Livermore that uses big lasers to kind of collapse and get the temperature. Uh, the idea these guys are using is they take magnetic fields and twist them. And that, that then creates a very efficient uh, fusion propulsion, but they haven't made it work yet. Uh, so it's mostly theoretical. There's a couple other ideas as well, but, but fusion is, uh, is probably later this century going to be the best way to get around in, in our solar system. Yep. How can the telescopes find life? It's a, the question is, how can telescopes find life? And, and that's a very good question, that uh, uh, there's a lot of efforts going on. Say, if we find a planet orbiting Alpha Centauri A, uh, how do we know if there's life there? And if it was a planet like the Earth, we'd look for a couple key things. The first one we would look for, does it have a, a fluid, a liquid, probably water. So you look for water signals, and uh, those could be done spectrally. Uh, but the more important thing is that, that one of the things we know that life does is it, it creates chemistry that's uh, what's called non-equilibrium, which means that if there wasn't something that was sustaining it, it will go away. In our own atmosphere, that there's a gas, oxygen, which if we didn't have life, the oxygen would go away in a few million years. So if we found a planet orbiting Alpha Centauri that had water and oxygen, we'd say that is evidence of life. And so to do that, we need to first separate the, the, the planet's light from the star. That's very, very hard. A, uh, the, the planet is only about a billion times it was a billion times fainter than the star. So you have to have a very special instrument that, that separates that. Uh, the best way to do that is with a big space telescope. The second thing you want to do is get a spectrum, you know, to break the light up to see if we can find the, the and there could be other gases and other molecules or, and, and, and fluids, but you know, the most obvious one is, is water and oxygen. Uh, the other thing is if, uh, if we get a good enough system, we might be able to see evidence of, of uh, on the Earth, for example, you could see chlorophyll, which is what, what plants use for energy. If we found a similar chemical in the spectrum, that would tell us there's something interesting going on on those planets. But that's a, uh, in our own solar system, uh, by going there, we can actually do things. We can maybe collect material and, and examine it in a, in a machine called a mass spectrometer. But in other solar systems, it's a remote sensing. Um. I assume that you would want airplanes to fly through this laser beam. Might it happen? I'm sorry, do you want me to talk to you? Yes, hold for the microphone, please. Oh, I'm sorry? Oh, I'll ask everyone uh, asking questions. Yeah. Just hold. 
I don't, you, I don't usually need artificial amplification. <laughs> uh, I assume that you don't want airplanes flying through this laser beam when it happens. I mean, we're talking about a lot of energy going through there, right? Uh, that's the, the question about flying through the beam is, no, that's why you want it in a place that's really isolated. The, the key thing is this would probably be internationally controlled. So there would be a go, no go. Uh, so uh, even today with higher, firing high powered lasers, you, you know, the FAA and others have to warn people away. Uh, plus there's a, the, the US Space Force has a, called the Laser Clearing House, and that if you wanna fire a laser into space, they have to tell you, okay, there's no satellites there. So the uh, uh, so that would be a you know a, a key thing. Now it turns out that it's not as bad as you might think. The the, the energy density near the the uh, the the transmitter is about ten suns. Now you don't want to hang around in it, but if something accidentally flew through it, uh, you know, especially an airplane, it would only be a few seconds. So it probably would survive. A satellite's even less because it goes through that. But you still don't want to have you know fly through it so one of the key things is to do a there would be a international control regime uh, ultimately if we decide we want to do this in a big way we'd put this on the far side of the moon but that's something for later in the century can I ask a, a second question yeah. I get the impression that it only takes one one hour blast to accelerate one of these yeah. probes out right yes okay question back Yeah, you, you mentioned that um, a lot of these exploration projects are really long term and, and aren't going to happen in your lifetime or my lifetime. So for the younger folks in the, in the audience here, the students, do you have some recommendations on um, you know, things that they should study in college yeah. and, and maybe which colleges they might want to go to yeah. if they're interested in, in space exploration projects? Uh, you asked me which college. I, I have to tell you, first of all, you know, where, where I went. <laughs> uh, I'm a University of Michigan grad, so go blue. Unfortunately, we, TCU ended that. Uh, but uh, uh, the, uh, certainly uh, in the sciences and mathematics, uh, you know, there are, you know, I mean, Berkeley is pretty doggone good, uh, although they turned me down for graduate school, so <laughs> I, I went to Arizona instead. Yes, yeah, it might be. <laughs> they didn't accept me either, so the, uh, Harvard did, so that. Uh, but I didn't go there. But uh, the, uh, uh, I think the key is, uh, if you want to get involved in these areas, is science and math. And uh, uh, I'd actually say one of the things that if I was starting now would be uh, biophysics, understanding life, uh, that engineering biology. Uh, you know, I think that, that understanding that there's a, there's a really exciting field called astrobiology that uh, is to understand how, what the diversity of life could be in the universe. Uh, so, you know, it's, uh, uh, but I think basically is just work hard and get excited about it. And because uh, it, it takes a commitment uh, on any science. Uh, another way to do it is what my sponsor does, is just make billions of dollars. Uh, he, he was a physicist, by the way, Yuri Milner. Uh, and uh, a, part, uh, a string theorist. And uh, the which I don't understand, uh, which he reminds me every once in a while. <laughs> but uh, but I, I think it's uh, you know there's a lot of exciting stuff. I think we're going to find life in the next decade or two, uh, either in our solar system or elsewhere. So it, it, I can't imagine a more exciting thing is is being a student now to to go into these areas. Another question. Suggestion and it is for another um, thruster and it is an Orion drive. It's a what? Orion drive. Ah uh, yes, the uh, the Orion drive was an idea that uh, that that was really started by Freeman Dyson, who you saw in the, in the picture there. Uh, his idea was that you would take a atomic bomb and you would drop it out the back of a really big spacecraft and then detonate it, it would push, and then you drop another one and push it. Uh, the, the trouble is that fission is not very efficient, uh, but you could use maybe a fusion bomb. Uh, unfortunately, or fortunately, the, there's the Outer Space Treaty that prohibits 
nuclear explosions in space. Uh, although I will say that when I was at NASA Ames, uh, we in the Jet Propulsion Lab did a, uh, a quiet little study that said that Orion uh, could get us around our solar system really good in using a modernized, so you don't need to use big bombs, you use small bombs, but they're still bombs. And, uh, but it's a very interesting concept. Uh, uh, when Freeman Dyson started doing this in the late 50s and early 60s, he thought we'd be traveling to Saturn with, within, a, within a, a decade. Uh, but the, uh, the test ban treaty and stopped all that. But yes, that's a great idea. Uh, I love Orion. But, but it's not legal to do it. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that, yeah, it probably does. I, also, it's not my billions of dollars either. Uh, hi, can you can you tell us more about uh, what happens once the Starshot uh, chip gets to Proxima Centauri? How long does it take? How, how long does it have to do big no. observations? How many images might we get back? How no. do we get them back? Well, at 20% the speed of light, you go through the system pretty fast. Uh, but you probably have uh, an hour or so where, you know, we're not going to fly that close to the planet. We would also use the sail as an optical element. So we'd probably fly within 10 million kilometers or so of the planet. And uh, so as you go by it, you know, you have the closest approach is a few minutes. So it's not much different than the Pluto flyby with New Horizons. Uh, we take maybe a few hundred images, and then as it leaves the, the Alpha Centauri system, it would turn around, lock on the Earth, and fire a, a laser beam back that may have a few hundred bits per second that we receive on the Earth. But we need a big optical element on the Earth, maybe an a optical array that's, that's tens of meters in diameter. But uh, uh, we've had a communications study on that, but it's, uh, uh, the, the main product is images. That we get back. So you need a laser on board. Need a la it's a very small laser, but you still need one on board. Yeah, four point four and a half years. But it 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 turns out that at 100 bits per second, it's going to take a long time. So it would take us probably years to get these 50 or 100 images back. Let's see. Question back or, or go ahead. Yeah. Hi, good afternoon. Um, so my question is about, uh, you know, you mentioned life and when we look about, when we look for biological life, but, you know, we look at carbon base or something similar to what we are familiar with. Is there any other ideas as to like what we may be looking for and recognize as life that might not be necessarily carbon based? Yeah, that's an excellent question. In fact, uh, you know, there's no reason to believe that it would necessarily be carbon-based or, you know, what the chemistry would be. Uh, it turns out that there is a professor at the University of Glasgow, Lee Cronin, who is a, is a biochemist. And uh, he's done a lot of work on, on how you might look for life. And his conclusion is that, uh, that he looks across a lot of, you know, chemistries. And he says that, uh, that non-life processes only produce a certain level of complexity. And so he'll take a, 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 a chemical mix and he say, okay, if I break this apart and see how complex these molecules are, he's a, he has a complexity index. And it's up to a certain number, it's, it's inorganic or it's, or it's not life. Uh, his point is that, uh, that you would look for complexity in the molecular structure, so you don't need to say necessarily it's carbon or anything. Uh, if, it, if, it's, if it's complex, it would be evidence of life. And, and, and he, his analogy said, well, if you went to Mars and uh, you saw, you know, a, uh, you, know you, you walked around and you, and you saw this laying on the ground. Uh, now, this is dead, but uh, if you started to break it apart, chemically, you'd say this is very complex. It would be put together by, uh, by a life process. So his point is that, you know, uh, I may end up finding, you know, things that are the biological equivalent or, or life equivalent of, of, of cell phones. Uh, how do I know that they were created by uh, life? And uh, so he, the complexity measurement is a good measurement. Uh, so that's what we, in, in fact, what we'll eventually, 
we, the follow-on probes that would be dropped in the Venusian atmosphere would have a mass spectrometer that would be able to, to determine the complexity of what we find. So it, it may be a completely alien process, especially one that's in pure sulfuric acid. Um, yeah, the, the, I mean, speaking of complexity, I'm, I'm thinking of, like, what's your take on human space exploration? Um, uh, because, you know, obviously sending small chips out yeah. to space feels easy compared to sustaining life, our, our life, and, and sending it out to places yeah. like Proxima Centauri. Th this is a, a very interesting philosophical question, and, and in fact, we're probably going to have a, uh, uh, a meeting at the University of Durham uh, this next year about, because there are questions about uh, if you send life elsewhere, there's both questions of is it useful, but is it, uh, is it ethical? You know, how do you know there's not life there? Uh, you know, I think the, the, if it's just science, or I shouldn't say just science, if it's scientific data you want, you probably don't need to send humans to do things. Uh, on the other hand, uh, the, the best description I uh, ever heard of why we should send people is, is uh, uh, from Jeremy Ostreicher at Princeton. He said, uh, well, the reason we send people is because we are people. If we were robots, we'd send robots. So I think it's more of a, of a cultural, philosophical question, not a scientific question. And, so th and that's sort of a, you know, the, the, in my view, that, you know, I'd like to see life, our life, expand. Uh, I mean, that's sort of a biological imperative now. Is that ethical, or you know, is there other life there? So who knows? But uh, but that's a very good question. How fast could they get to the planet? Well, that's a good question. How if we're going to another star system? If we go 20 percent the speed of light, that's 20, 25 years. So that's a long mission, but. Our spacecraft now that go to the outer solar system take, you know, 10, 20, 30 years to get there. Uh, we'd like to, in our own solar system, it currently takes years to go to the other planets in our solar system. Uh, but we think we can, you know, with, uh, with some of these new technologies, we might be able to get there in months rather than years. So that's the real objective is getting there faster. Um, do you believe in any theories about extraterrestrial life, like um, that we're the first, we're the last, the great filter theories, something like that? Boy, that's a good question for that's a good question for many drinks. Uh, the uh, uh, yeah, that's, the uh, uh, you know I don't know I uh, uh, you know everybody thinks because I was a general in the Air Force I know about some aliens. Uh, I, I wish I did. <laughs> the, uh, I don't think they know anything about them either. Uh, and by the way, the UAP phenomenon, I, I think it, it's interesting, but I suspect it has nothing to do with aliens. Uh, that having been said, uh, you know, we've been looking for signals now for half a century and, uh, and really haven't found anything convincing. The, the, my view is that when we find alien life, and particularly find alien, and I, I don't even like the word intelligence, but very complex life, that it's going to be really alien, and that it's going to be very hard to recognize that it's, uh, that it's, it's life. And that's why I think things like looking for complexity uh, is, is a way to do that. So, so I suspect the universe is teeming with life of some form. Uh, I'm also tend to be a. We, we had some seminars on this, but uh, I suspect that 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 the life in our own solar system originated elsewhere. We now know there's a lot of material that goes between star systems. Uh, it's it, the, the the name for it is called panspermia, but I've had a number of my colleagues say that's a sexist term. You know, we might should call it panovaria, and uh, so let's just say life from elsewhere, <laughs> and. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, but again, I, I you know you know one of the one of the most uh, interesting experiences, and this did involve booze. Uh, about 25 years ago, I was on a mountain bike ride across Costa Rica, and uh, uh, we were in a. I was with a British group, and we were having a bunch of gin and tonics, 
and uh, the restroom didn't work very well in the hotel. So I went out in the bushes. And uh, while I was out there, there was a, a creature coming out of the tree. And the creature was a, uh, was a tree sloth, which I have here on my cane. And uh, uh, the, doing the same thing I was, by the way. If you, the, the, uh, but uh, uh, tree sloths are very sophisticated animals. And uh, they're actually quite intelligent. But their metabolism is about 10% slower than, than yours and mine. And, uh, you know, you, you looked at this creature and you could tell in its eyes that it was a, a sophisticated animal, but it's moving very slowly. And that's only 10% difference. Uh, what if the chemistry that, that these, you know, alien entities is, is a, a hundred times or a thousand times faster or slower, you wouldn't even recognize it. And uh, the, the, the thing that I'm told, and I'm not a biologist, but that that the, uh, the, the, the thing that sets our time scale is the ribosomal protein generation, which is about a tenth of a second each step. So, you know, the fundamental chemistry is setting our understanding of time. What if the chemistry was different? So, the, whatever is operating in, and how would I recognize it if it's going 100 times faster or 100 times slower? You know, it's very hard to communicate. So I, I, I think that we're going to find We'll find alien life, it will be really alien, and uh, it'll be hard to recognize whether it's sophisticated or, you know, and I don't even like the word intelligent. But, uh, but that's, that's going to be a fun question. I hope we, hope we get a chance to study that in the next few years. Yeah, thank you. How do you see the mix of public versus private investment in space research and exploration changing over the next few decades? That's a very good question. I, you know, the uh, I spent most of my life, you know, spending public money, uh, and uh, the uh, we, we were quite successful at it. Uh, when I was at Ames, we had three lunar missions, and uh, the uh, uh, on the other hand, there's thousands of people that you have to convince. Uh, so the uh, the good news about the private sector is there's usually just one. The bad news is there's one. And uh, I, I think the best answer is there's a, there's a mix. Uh, you know, one of the things when we, we started this uh, SETI effort, uh, this was in, in 2015, uh, we made the announcement at the Royal Society in London. And, uh, uh, you know, SETI had originally been started, it was uh, initially a government effort. In fact, it was uh, headquartered at NASA Ames. Uh, but the members of Congress got involved in it. Uh, the, I think Senator Proxmire gave it the Golden Fleece Award, and some Republican said it was stupid, and, and so they terminated it with quite a bit of prejudice. Uh, at that point, uh, 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 Packard, David Packard, funded it. Uh, so so it, it kept up. But it, it, by the time we got there, there wasn't a lot of money for SETI. And, uh, uh, Yuri Milner, we had about 15 people, including Hawking, and, and Lord Martin Rees, the Astronomer Royal, and, uh, and uh, Andrew Yun, and uh, uh, Frank Drake. And so he asked all of us, he said, uh, look, uh, what do you think our likelihood of being successful in the next decade are? And, and I don't know, most of the answers were half a percent, two percent, one percent. and. Uh, so at the end of it, uh, I asked Yuri, I said, well, what do you think the likelihood is? And he said, 10 to the minus fifth. <laughs> and uh, I said, okay, this is interesting. Uh, I'd worked for the government a lot. If I'd have gone to the government and said, I want $100 million, to, and, and he said, well, what do, you, what do the experts think the likelihood of success? I said, well, I, one and a half percent. Uh, I'd get thrown out. But here I have a guy that, that, that thinks this is important enough that he's willing to spend his own money and he thinks it's much lower than we did. And uh, so I, I think that the, the, the mix is to have, you know, these visionary, you know, wealthy individuals fund things that are, that are uh, unlikely, you know, unpopular. Uh, and then at some point, so they remove the risk. And once it, they get to a certain point where it looks, okay, this is interesting, then the public uh, funding picks up. And so we, we work very carefully and closely. I mean, those telescopes we've been working on, uh, 
uh, we funded some of those, and, and governments have now funded some of them. So they're, you know, they're sort of joint, joint efforts. And uh, uh, so I think there's a, there's a mix. There's, a, there's obviously a, a political and ethical issue of, you know, is, uh, I, I know some of my scientific colleagues say, is it right that, that you guys circumvented the peer review process? And my answer is yes, <laughs> <laughs> because the peer review process often, you know, doesn't fund things that are really creative. I mean, they never would have funded Einstein on a peer review process. So uh, there are things that, that I think you need private funding for. So um, this laser beam, you said it's not in the visible range, right? I was just wondering, is it in the radio wavelength? Or is it in the ra radio wavelength? The, the laser beam we're going to use is at about one micron. So it's in the near infrared. Uh, I mean, you can see it with a set of, you know, infrared, you know, uh, uh, you know uh, goggles or something, but you wouldn't see it in there. So it's, uh, that seems to be the ideal wavelength because First of all, the, the, the laser transmitters are very efficient. So for the power put in, you get very high laser power out. Uh, and it's, uh, it's also very mature technology compared to other, other wavelengths. Oh. I'm sorry. They made me program director of my astronomical society because I asked more than 50% of the questions. <laughs> um, I, I noticed the spelling of your last name, and I'm wondering if you're related to Al Warden, the Apollo 15 astronaut. Sort of. Uh, the, uh, when I was the director at NASA Ames, Al Warden came to see me. And, and uh, the, uh, uh, he's from Michigan, like I am. And uh, uh, he'd actually worked at Ames after he was an astronaut. And, and uh, we got to compare notes. My, father, my grandfather was adopted by the Warden family. It was his family that adopted them. So, we're, so that's sort of related. Uh, but w what I thought was really f fun was, uh, you know, Al uh, said to me, he said, uh, he says, you know, you have the job I always wanted. He always wanted to be the director of NASA Ames. And I said, really? So you did what I always wanted to do. So, so uh, you know, so, so so it's kind of neat, no matter how cool that somebody had life or something else they wanted to do. But uh, uh, so yes, we're sort of related, I guess that. Well, it was it was interesting. I was uh, uh, the uh, uh, there was a uh, some sort of event at the University of Michigan because he'd gone there, and uh, uh, they wanted me to come and speak at it. And, and be the keynote, and uh, somebody said, uh, well, somebody told us he was your brother. A and I said, well, first of all, he's about 20 years older than I am, uh, but, uh, but second, and, and I, you know, I said, to be honest, you know, no, but uh, I would love to have him as a brother. He's a, he's a cool guy. Just passed away about a year or two ago. So who is actually doing the work on Starshot? Is it just universities? And is it expected that they'll take it all the way, or...? Will there be private companies working on it? Well, well the, the question is where the long-term funding is coming from. We, uh, Milner committed a hundred million. Uh, the uh, so far he's only spent about fifteen or twenty on the. Uh, we're about to enter our second phase, which is probably another fifty to seventy-five million. At which point we'd like to probably build a a small-scale prototype that we could. We could throw spacecraft, uh, you know, in, out of the ecliptic and into the inner interstellar space. Uh, that'd probably be a few hundred million. Uh, that's probably all doable with private uh, sector money. But we're thinking this thing's going to cost tens of billions. That's probably not private sector. Uh, that's clearly, in our opinion, a government function. So, we, and we're seeing more and more interest on the part of space agencies uh, on this. So. Uh, there would be sort of a transition. We think if we get to the point where you can demonstrate that this stuff all works, uh, maybe in, in 10, 15 years, that at that point, and, and we're seeing some funding already from the government. To, uh, NASA's put a little bit of money into these. Uh, actually, the Australian government's put more than just about anybody else has into it. Uh, yeah, it's well, r right now it's all private. It's, it's you know, it's... Uh, you know, most of it for Starshot is Yuri Milner, 
who's an Israeli investor. But he's... Oh, we, we, we have about uh, 30 different contracts, mostly at universities. So that's the, uh, the uh, so our, fa our first phase was to answer fundamental questions about the laser device, the, uh, uh, the uh, communications, can you can communicate back, and the material. Uh, so we've had about 30 or 40, mostly universities, a few private companies that are, that are doing the effort. Uh, we're probably going to do the second phase that we'll will have a university, probably Caltech, uh, lead that for us. And so uh, as you get moving along, more of it would be sort of companies and, and less universities. But there's a lot of university labs. But, but we think for the next decade or so, it's mostly, it'll be at least led by university uh, you know, research groups. I don't know if that answers the question. Yeah. One last question over here. Um, what if we go into an all-out war with aliens? We go with what? And go into an all-out war with aliens. That's an interesting question. <laughs> that we got to find them first. Uh, the uh, I, I do have a story to tell about wars with aliens. Uh, when I was the director at Ames, and I almost got fired for this, by the way, uh, somebody persuaded me to use Twitter. And, 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 and by the way, I'm not a fan of Twitter either before or after the new management uh, for this reason. But I, uh, uh, so I started to, to, you know, I said, well, people, I had like several thousand followers. They were wanting to hear about what, what does a NASA center director do? And, and so every few days I'd put some tweet out. I said, okay, I'm going to see this spacecraft put together, or, you know, I'm, you know, tasting the bad food in the dining room and so on. But it turned out we had the Elcross mission. Uh, the Elcross mission was a lunar mission uh, launched in 2009. Uh, there were uh, two lunar spacecraft on it. And uh, the, the secondary one was Ames' first big mission. And what we did is we had, we had a small spacecraft that, that was attached to the upper stage. Uh, the, the main spacecraft was built by the Goddard Space Flight Center. It was called the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, which is still operating. We took the upper stage and, and aimed it into a polar crater and dropped it into the crater. It, it, it blew a bunch of material up. We then had the spacecraft follow it and it had a spectrograph and it said, okay, there's about 5% by mass and the bottom of these craters is water. A very, very exciting effort that, that uh, uh, now, so, so I was at the, uh, the final readiness review. It was at Kennedy Space Center, and, and uh, I'd been to a lot of these, but this is the first time I got to sit at the adult table, and because there, there was a big room like about twice the size of this, there were two or three hundred people. Everybody had to wear coats and ties and formal, you know, in the middle of summer in Florida. It's kind of stupid, uh, but uh, uh, there was a big wooden table, and there's maybe 15 seats on it, and these are the the, the uh, when they do their readiness poll, they they give a briefing and then they, the, the launch director uh, or mission director goes around the table and does a poll. He says, weather, says weather is go. Range, range is go. Uh, booster, go. You know, he goes around and he says, primary payload. Says, so the Goddard director says, uh, Goddard Space Flight Center is go. Uh, and then he says, secondary payload. And so I said, uh, Ames Research Center is go for the first precision bombing run on the moon. And, and, and I got sort of nervous laughter. And uh, I thought that was kind of funny, so I put it on Twitter. That was a huge mistake uh, because uh, the, the PI called me and he said, what are you doing? He said, oh, nobody's going to pay attention. That's just a joke. And uh, he said, oh, yeah, they will. Well, it turns out I must have got, somebody got a hold of my email. I must have got about 50 emails. Says, I'm a mother, uh, you know, don't start an interstellar war. See, they, they thought I was going to bomb some alien base and that this was a super secret CIA, you know, I'm a retired general and everything. So they, uh, and, and I still said, well, that, that's just a few nutcases. But then the uh, NASA administrator called me and he said, what did you do? I said, why? And he says, well, Congressman Kucinich was just in my office 
and, and he, he is convinced now that there's a secret NASA, CIA, DOD plot to, about alien bases on the moon, and he wants to have a hearing on this. And, and, and I said, uh, well, boss, I'm sorry, but I just thought it was a joke. And he said, don't joke anymore. <laughs> so I stopped using Twitter. <laughs> and uh, yeah, that's it. So it's, uh, but uh, it was fun while it lasted. It was. <laughs>